Remain standing if you guys would. Remain standing just for a moment. And uh, we're going to be remaining standing for the reading of God's word in just about two minutes. But um, last night, I, I invited Aaron to come up here uh, this morning. But last night, I was having dinner with um, Aaron, his wife Kristen, and a few other people. And he just shared an awesome story about his form group. And in our form groups right now, which are discipleship groups based on the practices of Jesus. And so we're talking about fasting in this four-week module that we're in. And his group was praying together and fasting together, and they had a really amazing outcome. And so I just wanted you to share a little bit of the story of what you told me last night. Absolutely. So uh, in, in the form group, we're in week three. We just did week three. And week three was about um, amplifying your prayers and how fasting, in, in a way, spiritually fasting, like puts wings on your prayers and yeah. takes them up to heaven. It's a might be a funny analogy for some of you, but for whatever reason, fasting and prayer goes hand in hand. So on Wednesday, which is when our form group meets, Wednesday morning, uh, our group gets a text from a girl named Ashley who comes to the church here. She's in our form group. She said, texts her group and says, hey, everyone, uh, about 10 weeks ago, my grandmother broke her hip and she's been hospitalized for 10 weeks. And they finally let her out to go back to rehabilitation. But uh, as she was let out, she had some asym uh, what is the word? Uh, asymptomatic, thank you. I was thinking asymmetrical. That's not right. <laughs> that ain't it. <laughs> it's perfect. No, as <laughs> asymptomatic COVID. So her O2 is down, her low blood pressure issues, um, all sorts of things were going on. Her vitals were horrific. So she was hospitalized again. She texts the group and tells us uh, that night at form group, um, I I'm not sure... She said two things. I'm not sure if I'm ready for my grandmother to go. And the other thing she said is, I also, in all honesty, I'm struggling with the faith to believe that God will heal an elderly person. They're already at that age. Why would he heal? What, what's the point? What's the miracle there? So she's struggling. And so we prayed with her and we, we were all fasting with her. The very next morning, Thursday morning, we get a text in the group from Ashley. And she says, guys, my family was expecting her to die. Her vital signs were so low, there was no hope we thought this was it. But she woke up this morning and her vital signs were completely restored. She was able to get up, call her, call her son, Ashley's father, talk on the phone, and it's as if nothing had happened. Now she said, there's still a long journey ahead, but I think it's worth celebrating what God yes, has done. Yeah. So we wanted to celebrate with you yeah, this morning that in this miracle season that we've been talking about, miracles are happening. Healing is happening. Yeah. God is on the move. And there's something about this fasting and prayer, getting alone with God and anticipating him to do something miraculous. Guys, miracle season is here. Yes. It's here right now. Let's Thank go. You. Thank you, Aaron. Man, I hope uh, your faith is built a little bit this morning. And that's why I wanted him to share that. I was just sitting there at dinner thinking, this is getting my faith built. I am adding so much value to what it means to be a part of community and a form group. And so let me just tell you guys, raise your level of faith. Believe that God can do what only he can do. Get in community. If you're living life right now and you're going through a lot, don't go through a lot alone, but get around people. Let people weep with you, encourage you, pray with you, fast. There are people crazy enough, crazy enough in this church that they will not eat so they can pray for you. Right? And so we want to get you around people that can help build your faith in community. And that's what it's all about. And so today we're in week two of a series called Faith to Finish, a series all about faith. And last week we kind of set up a base, uh, a base and a foundation of faith. And today I want to begin to build on that. And we're going to pull out our first Bible character from the book of Hebrews, the Hall of Faith. And we're going to talk about a guy named Abraham today. And I'm actually going to start in Genesis chapter 12, where his story took place, and then we're going to move to Hebrews 11, which is the book that we're in throughout this series. And in Genesis chapter 12, here's what it says. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, now don't get confused, Abram is Abraham. God just renames him Abraham a little later in his story, meaning the father of nations. He says to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. He's promising children, offspring, generations here. I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'm not preaching about this today, but I just wanted to say this, that if God blesses you, if you're seeking a blessing or you are the recipient of a blessing, please understand that blessing is never meant to merely go to you. It is always meant to go through you. 
God is not just looking for people to bless. He's looking for people to bless who will bless others. Right, and I love what Lauren was just saying about money and, and everything is God's. So he's like, what I give you, I expect you to keep passing it on. But I'm not preaching about that today. So let's keep moving. Verse three says, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So we're seeing promise of children and nations and blessing and all these things. Then we go to Hebrews chapter 11. Now Hebrews 11, in my opinion, is kind of like the bonus content on the DVDs that we used to watch. Some of y'all don't know about DVDs, um, but I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, and I grew up loving the movie Shrek and the original Spider-Mans, and I used to love going to the bonus features tab and watching all the behind the scenes and the deleted scenes, and when the directors would narrate, you know, what was going on and what they were thinking at that part. Hebrews 11 is kind of like the bonus features content of the Bible. So it takes the stories that already exist, and now it's giving us a little bit of a behind the scenes look and some more insight to the faith of Abraham and his wife, Sarah. And in Hebrews 11, it says this, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going, but by faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah, this is Abraham's wife, herself received the power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, which is kind of a messed up way to say that he was old. He was old, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak just clearly through your word today. God, would you build our faith collectively as a church, individually as people. Lord, today we just ask and believe that by your spirit, we would be strengthened to obey you, God, when you ask us to step, to trust you in seasons where we're confused and we don't know what's going on, Lord. Give us great faith today, Lord. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. The church said together, amen. Go ahead and be seated today. Well, I don't know if you ever take a moment to think about what you might be remembered for in life. A lot of time for me, this comes on the end, the end of a funeral that I attend. And we're talking all about this person and who they were, what they accomplished, what they meant to everybody. I always get very reflective after moments like these. And I wonder for you, what will you be remembered for? Not just in life, but after you have passed from this life. And hopefully you're standing before Jesus in glory, you know? What will you be remembered for? Some of you guys might be remembered for your work ethic. People be like, man, they just outworked everybody. Everything they set out to do, if they put their mind to it, they accomplished it. Some of you guys might be remembered for your ability to make money. Others maybe for your generosity or for your hospitality. People might say of you, their front door was just wide open. They always had people in, always letting people stay in their home, eat in their home. You know, maybe, maybe people will talk about you and you'll be remembered for your affinity for a favorite sports team. I've seen this before too. Believe it or not, I've been to two funerals that were completely themed around the beloved NFL team of the person that had passed away. I've been to a Pittsburgh Steelers funeral where we actually had terrible towels on the seats that we were waving at one point. And I was like, this is strange. Um, I've been to a Green Bay Packers funeral, right? And so people are being remembered for this team that they love or characteristics of their life. And I wonder for us, what will will we be remembered for? We think about Abraham. This guy we just read about, and here we are 4,000 years after his life and his death. And Abraham is not only remembered today, but Abraham is remembered throughout scripture primarily for one thing. And the thing that Abraham is remembered for is faith. Everybody one time say faith. He's actually known in scripture as the father of faith. Abraham, the father of faith. All throughout history, people have been given similar titles to this. You have uh, Herodotus. He's the, the father of history. You have Frederick Douglass, and later the one who picked up the torch, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who were the father of the civil rights movement. You have our nation, who's given the title the Founding Fathers, not to be confused with Founding Farmers, a favorite destination of tourists everywhere in D.C. But the Founding founding Fathers who ideated and initiated our American society. And then we've got Abraham, right, the father of faith. I think it's the best title out of all of them. A man who is remembered for some pretty incredible moments in his life. 
You know, there's a lot of real estate given to Abraham in scripture. Genesis 11 through 25 tell the story of Abraham, his wife, Sarah, and their soon to be descendants. He's mentioned in nine additional books in the Old Testament. 11 of the 27 New Testament books talk about Abraham. And almost every time that Abraham is mentioned, then when they use his name, they associate Abraham with his faith. This was a man of great faith. One of my favorite Bible commentators, a man named R. Kent Hughes, he referred to Abraham as the undisputed paragon of faith. I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but it sounds incredible, right? The undisputed paragon of faith. And Abraham's so famous that many of us even know a song that we grew up singing about Abraham that I'm not about to sing for you, but I will recite some of the lines. It goes something like, Father Abraham had many sons. And then we take it back. And many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you, so let's just praise. We went to the same kids' church, guys. Some of you that are newer to the faith are like, what is happening right now? Odds are you've never seen VeggieTales either. But we were, we were raised, we were theologically uh, formed by, by talking vegetables, a lot of us who grew up in church. You know, um, I really, I'm going to have to preach about Abraham in two parts. I sat down earlier this week to write a, a sermon where we could cover the three big moments where Abraham really was uh, tested in his faith that it talks about in Hebrews 11. I texted my wife on like Thursday and I was like, I'm writing a message that's at least an hour and a half long. So we got to reel some of this back in. So today what I want to do is give you really the first two thirds of the faith of Abraham. What we see from Hebrews chapter 11. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to glean from his life. I love Hebrews 11 because it gives great examples of what people not only believe by faith, as we talked about last week, but what they did by faith, how they lived by faith. I think there's two main things that we can draw from the life of Abraham today that I want to specifically talk about as we are seeking to be people that when we die and when our legacy continues on, that we would be people that are known for being people of faith. That's the desire, the desire for my life. That is my desire for your life. Now, to be a person of faith, this is going to sound really basic today, but I want to talk about two things that we see that Abraham did that I think that we need to do and we can apply to our lives as well. And here's, here's what it is simply today. It might sound simple, but I don't think it's easy. And it's this. We need to have a willingness to obey and trust in the delay. That's what we're going to talk about today. A willingness to obey and having trust in the delay. So let's jump into the first thing here. What we see from Abraham is a willingness to obey. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says this. By faith... Abraham obeyed. One time, everybody say obeyed. And when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. You know, I talk to so many people who are craving direction in life. I talk to an incredible amount of people. They, they just want to know, where is it that God is calling me to go? What is it that God is calling me to do? And I wonder I ask this rhetorically to think about it in your mind today, if any of you are in that position today. I was at my forum group this past Wednesday night and we were talking about prayer and fasting. And in that, somebody brought up that they are praying and fasting for direction in life. And so we ended up getting in a 30 minute conversation in our forum group about direction and giving advice and just talking and listening to one another and then being able to pray for one another. It was a, it was a special moment. But what I'm realizing in that group is it wasn't just one person. It was the vast majority of the people in that room are like, I need God to speak. I need God to show me where he's wanting me to go and what he's wanting me to do. Delaney and I, my wife and I, we were young adult pastors for about nine years prior to moving here to start this church. And, you know, young adults, age 18 to 28 was, was the age range of our group. And I believe that there are two main things that young adults are looking for in life. And those two things are love and direction. And I know this because anytime we would do a series on relationships or finding the will of God, we would double in attendance. And in my, I think Siri's talking to my, in the tent over there. Um, and we would double in attendance. And basically, I'm, I'm sitting there in my, in my mind, I'm not saying this out loud to people, but in my mind, I'm thinking, where were y'all when we were talking about consecration? You know, that's why I feel like everybody wants to not be lonely more than they want to be holy. But I didn't say that out loud. I just thought that in my head. Anyway, um, well, let's keep moving on. At the end of the day, we all know we all want to know where God wants us to go. We all have this deep desire to know what is it that God is calling me to do? Who is he calling me to be? But let's be real for a second. One of the most frustrating things about the life of faith is that the way in which God gives clarity is not always that clarifying. Let's go back to the story of Abram for a second. God comes to Abram, and here's the direction that God gives Abram. He says, Abram, go to the land that I will show you. 
And we've joked about this before, but those are some of the worst directions that have ever been given in human history. Go to the place I will show you. And what I admire about Abraham is he was just crazy enough to actually do it. He grabs his family and a couple things and just like, let's go. And they're like, Abraham, where are we going? It's like, I'm not really sure. When are we going to turn? I don't know. We're just waiting on God to say, this is where we're going to be. And in great faith, he stepped out, not knowing where he would go, but knowing that God had commanded them to go. And that was enough for Abraham. You know, so often I feel like this is how God operates. He'll say things to you like, first, I want you to go and then I will show. But how often do we say, no, 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 God, first you show and then I'll go. I need you to reveal to me where all this is headed. One of my favorite features when I'm driving somewhere and I, and I wanna know, like I have to use my maps, is I like to zoom out and know where I'm going before I just set out on this adventure right across the city of, of Washington, D.C. But can I just say this, guys? In the life of faith, unfortunately, there's no zoom out feature. God's gonna have a destination for you, but by and large, you're only gonna be able to see one move at a time. You know, I was, I was thinking this earlier this week that God gives directions kind of like my wife does. Anytime I'm in the car and she's navigating, I want like the next five steps. And she's like, so I'm like, where do I go? What am I doing? She's like, just keep driving. Just trust me. And I'm like, well, am I in the right lane? You know, you ever been driving with somebody and they're like, you're going like 65 down the interstate and they're like, there's your exit. And you're like, you know, that's why we, we can trust God though. He doesn't do that to us. But God does, what he does though is we want, the next, we want step three, four, and five. And God says, I'm going to give you the next step. And I want you to trust me enough to, to step in obedience, even when you don't know the outcome. To step even when you don't know the final destination of where he's taking you. And the truth is this, that a lot of the time, God wants us to say yes before we know the details. I think God is kind of like that friend that texts you and asks you, hey, can you do me a favor? It's the most loaded question a human being can ask. And I hate when people ask me, hey, can you do me a favor? And I'm always like, maybe. It depends. Because you might ask me to drive you to Dulles Airport. And at that point, like, we're not going, you know? I will pay for your Uber to go. I'm not driving you. Or God forbid, they're like, I'm moving Saturday. Will you help? And it's like, I have a thing. I've got stuff that I've planned weeks ago. I always tell people, you know your real friends when you move. Those are the ones that show up. For the men in here, it's like, those are your groomsmen. The guys that show up to help you move, just lock them in. Those are the guys right there that you want to walk with in life. Anyway, God, what, what I think God wants when he wants us to say yes prior to knowing what we're going to do and where we're going to go. One of the things that God is looking for is he's looking for a willing heart. Do you have a willing heart? He's not looking for people that say, okay, God, I'm willing if you give me the details and you tell me that this story has a great ending. No, he says, I'm looking for people that when I say, will you go, that they say, yeah, where are we going? That's the attitude of the mindset that God is looking for. You know, this has been a little bit of the story of my family. The long story is, is 13 years in the making when I felt God called us to this initially. But really over the last three and a half or four years, my family's kind of been in this season of God giving us a directive and there being a lot of unknowns surrounding it. Around 2018, my wife and I were both feeling this stirring by the Holy Spirit where we already knew that we wanted to plant a church. We just didn't know where, we didn't know when, but we felt God beginning to stir. And through our prayer through just doing some investigation of the entire country, right? We, we didn't know where God wanted us and we searched and we traveled to a few places. And then through some pretty incredible divine confirmation, God made it very clear that he wanted us to move from Albuquerque, New Mexico, 2,000 miles to Washington, D.C. to start a church. It was so clear to us that we felt that we would actually be disobedient to not go. That's how intense this feeling was. That's how intense this command from God was for us to go. And so we started doing all this stuff we start telling people about our plan. We start packing things and selling things. I was talking about this a little bit last week. And we felt that God was saying, I want you guys to go. And, and people started asking me all kinds of questions. There were so many unknowns. I had questions, other people had questions. And people would come to me and ask me things like this. Brandon, love that you're going to DC, but like, who's going with you? And I was like, I don't know. We'll find out. They would ask me questions like, uh, well, where, where are you going to live? And I'm like, I have no clue. I keep, people keep talking about this thing called the DMV. And I'm like, why are we so obsessed with the Department of Motor Vehicles around here? So confused by what the DMV was. People kept talking about it when I moved here. And I'm like, what is the deal? Where are you going to live? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, how are you going to afford DC? And how are you going to get funding for this church? And I'm like, I don't know. All I know is if it's God's will, it's God's bill. Come on, somebody. Right? And easy to say, much harder to live that out. And then people would be like, where's the church located? Do you even have a building? I'd be like, no, we don't. 
we're two years in and we still don't have a building. We just rent this place on Sunday mornings, but by faith, our church is believing for a building, right? And so we're, we're believing, we're in a season where we're saying, God, you can provide, but back then and still today, I don't know. People would ask, um, well, do you think this is actually going to work, right? And, and people would also ask me, can people actually just start churches? Like, that just seems like a bizarre thing to do. And it's like in their mind, it's like Peter and Paul started every church 2,000 years ago, and they still just exist today. And so people had all kinds of questions. And if I can just be honest with you, there were moments I responded in great faith. And there were moments that these questions would actually linger with me as I laid in bed at night before I ever moved, just thinking, God, I don't know how any of this is going to work. But what I had to keep me grounded in that moment was a directive and a command from God. You know, also one of the mornings in that season, I woke up early and I was reading my Bible and I stumbled upon Acts chapter 20. And this passage of scripture, when I tell you that it changed everything for me in that season, it changed everything. And in this passage of scripture, in Acts chapter 20, this is the apostle Paul talking and he's been spending some time with some of the churches that he's planted and the church leaders and there's great affection and there's great safety where he currently is but he's about to leave. And he says this in Acts 20, he says, and now compelled by the spirit, which is an important four words because what Paul is saying is that this is not my idea, this is God's idea. I'm compelled by the spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, and then look what he says next, not knowing what will happen to me there. So his story is a little different than Abraham. He knew where he was going, but he still had no clue what was gonna happen when he got there. Look at what he says in verse 23. Actually, the only thing I do know is that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So I'm going there. I don't know what God's got, got planned. I don't know what he's up to, but all I do know is I'm probably going to prison and I'm gonna deal with a lot of difficult stuff. But Paul still goes. Look what he says. However, I consider my life worth nothing. This is a man who has died to himself and is now alive in Christ. And he says, my only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. I remember reading that at 5.30 in the morning in a season of so much confusion and unknown where I needed to trust God and these words gave me life. And I began to reflect on Abraham and I began to think about Paul and I began to realize that if God would tell Abraham to go and he just went and God had him covered and taken care of and if God would tell Paul to go and he says, I've got you taken care of even though you're gonna face some difficult things, if God can do it for them, then God can do it for us. And that's what gave me the faith to continue to step in obedience when I had no idea what would be the outcome on the other side of that step. Coming here was a giant leap of faith. And I'm so glad that I did. I love every single thing that God is doing and I'm living in the faithfulness of God. And what I admire about Paul is he had no promise of a favorable outcome. All he had was a prompting by the spirit to go. And I wonder for you in this church today, is that enough for you? Do you need a promise of a favorable outcome at every turn? Or is it enough if God just says, this is what I want you to do? And you say, here I am, Lord, for your glory, for your purposes, use me. You know, often the life of faith comes what I refer to as certain uncertainty. You wanna know, you wanna know what it means to live by faith? It means that you can be certain that there will be a lot of uncertainty and that you're gonna have to trust in and lean on God more than you ever have in your life. You see, you don't need faith if you've got all the facts. And we're not called to live by facts, we're called to live by faith. So we gotta have faith in the one that we can put all of our trust and confidence in. Oswald Chambers says, certainty is the mark of the common sense life. He says, gracious uncertainty is the mark of the spiritual life. We don't wanna live the common sense life. We wanna live the spiritual life. So it's gonna come with gracious uncertainty. And so God wants us to walk in obedience even when we don't know the outcome. And I think this is probably the most difficult for people who like to have control, right? And you know who you are. Right, you've told people before, I'm a control freak, right? And there's a lot of us in this room, though, like we need control. We need to know what, we need to know when, we, we like to, but here, can I just tell you this? Can I, I don't know if this will encourage you, but it'll at least, it'll, it'll shake you a little bit. That control is only ever an illusion. We don't have control of anything, right? We're, we're, we're not controlling what happens to us. We don't have control of the outcomes in our life. We, we can't control other people. You might try, but you can't do it. And we, we sure as heck can't control God. The only thing you can control is you, but most human beings struggle with self-control. So it really is difficult as we step back and realize that I don't really control anything. Sometimes my response and sometimes the things that I'm doing, but even, even with that I struggle and I don't need spirit control, but I need the Holy Spirit to come in and give me self-control that I don't have. And so if we, here, here's my conclusion on this. 
If we can't control anything, then we ought to put our faith in the one who controls everything. And I think the faster we can get to the realization that my life is in God's hands, the more willing we will be to trust his hands and actually put our life in them. Guys, we don't have control. So we gotta trust the one who does and he's calling us to obedience even when we don't know the outcome. So like Abram, when God says, go to the land that I will show you. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know if that's a business endeavor. I don't know if that's you moving somewhere. I don't know if that's you staying somewhere. Sometimes it takes more faith to stay than to leave. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know if it's a relationship that you start, a relationship that you get out of, but what is God calling you to do that you don't know the outcome? And today he's prompting you by his spirit saying, can you go even if you don't know all of the details? Can we lean in and lean on our God? So what we see from Abraham is a willingness to obey. And the second thing that I wanna talk about today is what we see from the life of Abraham is trust in the delay. That if we wanna live a life of faith that we have to learn to trust in the delay. One Bible commentator writing on Hebrews 11, he was writing about what God was calling each of these amazing men and women of faith to do. And if you know Hebrews 11 well, we've already skipped three people. We've, all, we've skipped down to number four, who was Abraham. And here's what the commentator said though. He said, God called Abel to worship by faith. He said, God called Enoch to walk by faith. He called Noah to work by faith. But in many ways, he called Abraham to wait by faith. Now, I don't know about you, but of all the things that I can do by faith, I think waiting is the last thing that I want to do by faith. Right? I don't know if any of you struggle with patience. I definitely do. And I love to tell people I'm not impatient. I just don't like to wait. That's the difference. You know what I mean? But I don't want to, I don't want to wait by faith. I'd rather work by faith. I'd rather worship by faith. I'd rather walk by faith. But this is one of the things that God calls Abraham to do. So if we go back to Abraham's story for a moment, Abraham is kind of minding his own business. As far as we know, he doesn't ask God for any of this stuff. And, and God comes to him, the word of the Lord comes to him. And he says, Abraham, I'm gonna make you into a nation. I'm gonna bless you and I'm gonna bless your descendants and you will be a blessing to the world. You may not know this, but when this word comes to Abraham, Abraham is already 75 years old and his wife, Sarah, is 65 years old. They've never had a child. And as far as they know and what they've concluded is that his wife is barren. And so the word comes to Abraham, says, you're going to have a child. And I think, I imagine that they get pretty excited. I think they're like, oh my gosh, you're, I'm 75, you're 65, we're going to have a kid. And they're telling their family, they're telling their friends. And they're like, I know we're old as heck, but like God's going to do this. We've got great faith. And I imagine they're picking out wallpaper for the nursery. Sarah's picking up volume one of what to expect while you're expecting. And they're just prepping, they're getting ready, they're getting excited. And then here's what I just find baffling about this story. As you fast forward 10 years, and please understand, I, I did not misspeak. I don't mean to say 10 months. You fast forward 10 years, and there's still no child. There's certainly no great nation. If I'm Abraham, I'm sitting here thinking, like, God, if you're going to make a nation out of me, like, we probably should be knocking out kids, like, every nine or 10 months, right? We're going to need at least 50 of these. 10 years later, nothing. And God comes to Abraham well, Abraham's hanging out in his tent, that I fully imagine probably looks something like this. Not really, but God comes to Abraham and Abraham is in his tent and he's not very happy with God and they begin this conversation. And God comes to Abraham who's essentially pouting in his tent. He's upset. And in Genesis 15, it says this, that after the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, he said, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. And so he's sitting here 10 years later, having a dialogue with the creator of the universe. And if you'll let me, I kind of put my own imagination into this conversation and trying to put myself in Abraham's shoes. And I feel like Abraham, maybe the conversation went something like this, that he's saying, God, look, in, in year one after you gave the promise, I mean, we were full of faith. We were telling everybody about the promise. And, and then in year two, we, you know, we remained patient. We held on to hope and just thought, okay, like, you know, God's got this. We're two years in now. In year three, God, we fasted two days a week waiting for you and begging you to come through. And then in year four, we started to doubt. 
And then in year five, the disappointment came between me and Sarah and we, we fought all the time. And then in year six, we kept ourselves busy and honestly just didn't even talk about it much. And then in year seven, we heard a great sermon on faith and our hope was reignited and we formed a group of intercessors on group me and they were helping us pray and believe and just building our faith. And then in year eight, we honestly started to get kind of embarrassed that nothing happened. And then in year nine, I started to tell myself that I must have just misheard. That maybe I, I made this whole thing up and now Abram's sitting here in year 10 disappointed and disillusioned. And I wonder if anybody in the room has been in this place before, disillusioned by God, disappointed in him and in his timing. And then God does something. He tells Abraham to get out of his tent and he kind of goes a little bit Neil deGrasse Tyson on Abraham. And he says, Abraham, look up at the stars. And in Genesis 15 verse four, he says, would you look at the stars, look at the sky. He says, count the stars if you can. He said, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is a really beautiful scene in scripture. Disappointed and disillusioned Abraham, God comes to him, promises him, he makes him look at the sky. This moment, at least in my imagination, is giving like Simba and Mufasa, you know, the epic moment in the sky. It's kind of, what, it's kind of how I picture it, the music, all the things. And they make a covenant together. Animals are sacrificed, right? I mean, there's a whole covenant that happens in this moment. And now if I'm writing this story, what you're gonna find is that if I'm the author, about a week later or a month later, Sarah is pregnant and they're on their way to becoming a great nation. But if you know this story, that's not what happens. God is writing something much bigger and much more unique. And here's the reality, not 10 years later, but 15 years later, there's still no child, still nothing. And it's at this point in the midst of these 15 years that Abraham and Sarah start to take matters into their own hands, which I, I, I'm thinking here, I'm like, can you blame them? Like if you're waiting 25 years for God to show up and here they begin to take matters in their own hands, like so many of us do on so many occasions. And Sarah just, I think, gets this kind of anger. She just kind of gets this attitude toward God where she's like, if God's not going to do it, then I will. And she starts to hatch this plan and Sarah ends up trying to force outcomes and in attempts to orchestrate the fulfillment of God's promise without God's involvement in the process. Which let me tell you this church, that's never a good idea. You don't wanna to try to orchestrate the fulfillment of God's promise without God in the process. And this is what she does. And so she hatches this plan and she goes, here's an amazing plan. I'm gonna have Abraham sleep with my younger servant, Hagar, and she'll carry the baby and bam, nation form, problem solved, what could go wrong? So Sarah then goes to Abraham and she says, Abraham, I need you to sleep with my servant who's much younger. Remember, Sarah at this point is nearing 90. So I need you to sleep with my servant who's much younger than me. And I imagine Abraham was like, okay, you know. I think at first he probably had to act like this was a bad idea. He's like, you know, I do not want to do this, but I feel that God's in it. So, you know, we just suffer for the Lord out here. And, and Abraham, I don't know what happened to him and his faith in this moment, but he goes through with it. And they end up having a son through Hagar and they named the son Ishmael. And if you were here on Labor Day weekend, we had our five and five, five people preached five minute messages and Fran Washington preached on this passage. And I thought I did an amazing job at unpacking the emotional turmoil that took place in this moment, right? This didn't just impact Abraham and, and Sarah, but this had great impact on Hagar and her son Ishmael. They're, they're pushed out and pushed aside. Feelings are hurt. Sarah's mad at Abraham and Sarah's mad at Hagar. And Hagar's like, what the heck, Sarah? This was your idea. There's a fractured marriage. There's resentment and regret. And then Hagar and her son are, are cast aside. They're pushed out into the wilderness. And there's a lot of collateral damage that takes place in this moment. The impacts are massive. You know, I just want to bring this up today because I think any time in our life that we try to get ahead of the plan of God, the ramifications are not going to be for the better. They're going to be for the worse. And it will never only be you that's affected, but likely there will be other people impacted by your decision to try to outpace the grace of God. And so other people are impacted. My wife mentioned this about six weeks ago, and I wanted to repeat it, that the only thing waiting on God, the only thing harder than waiting on God is wishing that you had. Please don't get me wrong. The sting of waiting is painful. Nobody likes to wait especially if you feel like God is up to something and God has given you a promise that you're holding on to, the sting of waiting hurts, but the sting of regret 
will hurt far worse and often will bring other people into that same pain. And I know some of you know this firsthand. Maybe you've had moments in your life where you tried to outpace God and you thought, man, I'm gonna put this in my own hands. And some of you right now can reflect in real time on some things that have happened recently or in your past. And sometimes we, we try to blame all sorts of other things for messes that can be made in our life. You know, we blame, we blame God and his, his slowness. We blame the devil. We blame circumstances. But I think if we're honest, many of these moments and many times when we make a mess, it's us trying to outpace God in the very race that he has set for us. And I want to encourage you by saying this today, that let God set the pace for your race. You're not the pace setter, he is. So he says, let me set it and you just, you get right behind me and you go with me. God sets the pace. But this is tough because it's easy to grow impatient. It's easy to begin to doubt God and his timing. Peter talked about this in his second letter. Because there were people that were beginning to doubt that Jesus was going to return. They were already having trouble with this 2,000 years ago. And they're like, man, God is just being slow on his promise. And Peter gives us a pretty amazing insight to the timing of God. Now, in context, this is about the return of Christ. But I think we can gain a larger truth from this. He says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. The truth that we gain from this is this, that God's timing is not like our timing. That we cannot hold a God who is outside of time and who created time to our finite understanding and experience of time. God is not bound to the Apple watch on your wrist. I know we want him to be. God is not bound to our calendar. He's outside of these things. And if it's not on our timing, then we have to submit to the realization that God's up to something different than our expectations. And I, please, I hope you don't hear me say that as that's something that's easy to do. It's not. It's one of those complicated things that so many people have to walk through. You know, I heard a pastor say this one time. He said, God is never late, but he's rarely early. <laughs> I wish God was early. I wish God would show up early, but he's an on-time God, and it's in his timing. You know, weirdly enough, I'm kind of encouraged by this story, and, and the reason I'm encouraged by it is that the father of faith had a very imperfect journey of faith. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm hard on myself in seasons that I felt kind of faithless, in seasons that I'm far too pragmatic, and I need the details, and I need to understand before I move, and I don't live a perfect life of faith, but I'm encouraged by this because the father of faith did not have a perfect journey of faith. And I think that should encourage you today to know that God's not looking for you to be perfect because we're gonna have moments that we're faithless, but the good news is that when we're faithless, God is still faithful. We serve a faithful God who can be trusted, who can be believed, and that when he says go, we can go. So God comes back to Abraham another time and he makes him another promise. And he says, Abraham, the son is gonna come not through Hagar, but through Sarah. What I told you in the very beginning, it's coming through Sarah. So don't try to take this in your hands again and mess things up again. And he says, this time next year, you're going to have a son. And it's hilarious because Sarah is outside the tent. This is another tent conversation going on. And Sarah is standing outside the tent. And there's something about the nature of the way that God is communicating to Abraham that Sarah can overhear the conversation. And she hears God say this. And it says that Sarah, standing outside the tent, hearing God say that you will hold a baby next year, she laughs. She scoffs. She's like, just in unbelief, she's like, there's absolutely no way. And then she says something that when you translate it from the like original Hebrew to English is actually kind of a crass statement. She says something to the extent of her disbelief is not so much that it's not that I can't carry this baby. It's God. He's 100 and I'm 90. How are we going to make this baby? That's basically what she says. So Sarah laughs at God. And then one of the funniest conversations in the Bible takes place next. And God looks at Abraham and goes, did Sarah just laugh? And Sarah goes, I didn't laugh. And God's like, no, but you did laugh. And he's like upset with her. And then God does this. He goes, because you laughed, when you have your son, you're going to name him Isaac, which means laughter. And I think God was showing them that every time you call the name of your son, you're going to remember the moment that you doubted. And you're going to remember to never doubt again. So as we progress in the coming weeks to another portion of Abraham's faith journey, we're going to have a greater understanding of why he was able to walk it out with such faith he has seen God do what only God could. And it says this in Genesis 21, so we're kind of wrap this up. He says, the Lord kept his word. Hopefully that encourages somebody in this space and just lifts your spirit today. The Lord keeps his word. 
And he did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. And she became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. And this happened just at the time that God said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. You see, let me wrap up with this thought. If it's not God's timing, you can't force it. But if it is God's time, you can't stop it. Let's be people that say, God, it's in your time. If you guys would stand with me today. I just wanna take a moment to pray over us as I begin to wrap up for a second. If you guys would actually bow your heads and close your eyes. Actually, just I have two quick responses. I'm gonna ask for hands raised, but I won't bring anybody forward. Response one is gonna be in regarding to those who just are needing some direction right now. And you're saying, Lord, I, I need to know what you want me to do, where you want me to go. And you're also gonna raise your hand signifying that I'm praying for faith to be able to follow through when he does say it. And the second is gonna be in regards to those who are in a waiting season. And you're saying, look, I'm waiting, but I'm believing. And I'm not gonna try to get out in front of God, but I'm gonna continue to believe by faith. So those of you in here that saying, I'm, I'm needing direction from God and I want the faith to be able to step out when he does. Would you guys boldly raise your hand? I just wanna see where you guys are. It's about a, at least a third of the room right now has their hands up. Okay, you guys can put your hands down. And I tell you how many people are raising their hands so you can understand that if you're feeling directionless, you're not alone. And then maybe those of you that might be in a waiting season where you're trusting, you're believing, you're hoping, you're praying, you're fasting. And you just want the faith to continue to trust, to believe, to hope. Would you guys raise your hand? I wanna know who I'm praying for in this season as well. So many hands here too. Awesome. If you raise your hand for either, would you raise it up in the air for both of those? And I just wanna pray for you today. Heavenly Father, Lord, for those who need the, the trust to step, God, they need to hear your voice and need to know with some clarity. God, maybe, maybe you're not gonna tell them the destination, but Lord, if today, Holy Spirit, you could just begin to give that first step. We pray for clarity, God. Give a call to those who have been desperate. And would you partner, Holy Spirit, with the faith to step out the faith to go. And God, we pray for direction. We pray for clarity in Jesus' name. And God, those who are raising their hand that are just saying, God, I wanna keep hoping, keep trusting, keep believing. Lord, let us trust you and lean into you. Help us not get impatient and try to outpace, outpace grace. But we trust you, God. You are a God that is faithful. You are true to your promise and you are trustworthy. We ask you to do these things. We believe you can do these things. And we believe by faith as a church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.